Okay. As I was just saying, and you'll notice I don't have my headset on today, and I don't have my tripod today, because everything's sitting in my office at work. Except for the webcam, which I had a spare at home. So there it is. So we're doing this uh, little more blurry audio. Uh, my phone's pretty good on that. It'll pick up voices up to the fourth row. Uh, so if you have a question, speak up and you'll get recorded. If you want to be heard on the internet, well then. Um, as I was just explaining, I don't do traditional reviews because I record all my lectures. Therefore, you know, you can actually go back and look at points you're not sure about by looking back at the lectures that have it in detail. But what I do usually do at the end is tell you guys what you should be looking at for uh, the exams. And uh, some of the details about it also. Um, there's the word wrap. Right over here. Okay. First things first, I'll talk about the theory exam. It's currently sitting at about 50 questions, half of which I've inherited. I'm currently paring down the pile that I inherited in inserting my own questions. Uh, therefore, the number may change up and down a little bit from 50, but it's going to be roughly 50 questions. It's multiple guess, no fill in the blanks now that I discovered that Canvas is terrible at filling the blanks. Um, so I'm going to be going through that exam one more time to make sure that the questions are all the same. Because um, some of the questions I inherited included how do you pattern match in an SQL statement? Stuff you guys learned last term. Uh, I don't know what this exam was about, except whoever wrote it decided that they were going to uh, retest you on stuff you've learned previously. I'm getting rid of all that stuff. It's Wednesday, April 19th, 6 to 8. In other words, this room, this time, next week. It's ignore access that says you're supposed to be, I think, is it Monday? It's writing down an exam somewhere. I'm not going to be there. If you show up there, you're there by yourself. Or you didn't watch this. And you didn't pay attention to every single time I've said it. Or you also don't pay attention to the announcement I'm going to put on Canvas. If you've missed all these, you deserve to miss the exam next week and show up for an empty room. That's going on YouTube be saying you deserve to miss your exam. It's a Canvas test, which means it's open everything because there's no way I can stop you from actually not using your computers since it's on Canvas. That just means that some of the wording is a little trickier. Um, that kind of stuff. So what should you review? It covers the same materials as test one and two, plus some stuff with functions and triggers. In other words, it covers everything you've learned. Um, what's the proportion right now? It's about it's about, I'd say it's about 30, 33% each chunk. So there's an equal number of questions about what was from test one, what's from test two, and what you've learned since. Um, I strongly recommend you review the PowerPoints and the PDFs. Essentially, this is the stuff you need to reread. If you haven't read it, now's the time. If you've read them, congratulations. You probably just want to skim through it real quick just to make sure you're up to date. Now, as for the practical, it's a Canvas test. I'm using the test format instead of you uploading a Word document to me. Why? Because it's easier for me to grade. It keeps things nicely formatted. Um, there's four questions on it. That means you've got four tasks. You're going to do a single conceptual ERD. Not the logical, not the physical. And by conceptual, I mean entities, relationships. If you want to take the time to add all the attributes, knock yourself out. When you see what I'm making you diagram, you're going to choose really quickly to not add all the attributes. Just putting it out there. Um, you need to restore a database. I'm going to post this on, Black, on Canvas, by the way. So we're all either typing, typing madly, I'm posting this on, on Canvas before I leave today. Um, 
you got to learn how you got to remember how to restore a database. If you are not able to restore a database, and you're here today, you may want to come pay me a visit to try to refresh that for you. Um, there's a dozen. Different, there's three different ways to restore. Take your pick. Because um, and also you're going to create uh, two triggers. They're not big triggers, and one of the triggers is literally, you know, a single if statement. Actually, it's an if else, and the other one is also uses ifs and whatnot. Um, so, what should you review? How to draw a conceptual diagram? How to restore a database? How to create triggers? You know, like the last couple of labs you guys were doing. That. Um, how to use if statements? How to raise slash signal an error from a trigger? If you go look at the examples I posted, it's all there. Um, how to calculate the length of a string in SQL? There's a function call that does this. Make sure you know what that is. And that's like a big, huge hint right there. Know how to do that. And if you know how to do an if statement, you know how to calculate the length of a string, you should. It should be gravy. Um, realistically, I'm guessing the two triggers should probably take maybe 20 minutes each. <coughs> or the first one might take half an hour and the second one will take 10 minutes, depending on how you interpret my instructions. Uh, the conceptual diagram, that depends on how well you work with it. Um, as I've told other people before, I found a really cool diagramming tool you can use for this, uh, ERD+. Um, it's online, it's web-based, it's designed specifically for creating conceptuals. It's like a sliced bread. Um, if somebody reminds me by the end of the lecture today, I'll post a link to it on Canvas. And I think I already did. I think it's already in the announcements that I found this cool tool to do this for you. Uh, it even exports as a PNG, which is pretty fantastic. Okay, this is what you should review for the practical. The list of that is what you should review for the, for the written exam. Like I said, it's only 50 questions. It shouldn't be apocalyptic grade exam. Uh, the concept, the practical, probably take you almost a full time. And I didn't put down dates on that because it's in your typically scheduled lab. Therefore, if you are supposed to be in lab on Monday, you probably want to go show up to lab on Monday and get it done. Otherwise, you don't. This. Unless you have prior arrangements. And if you decide you want to hurry and go hide and go past, spend time in somebody else's lab around the corner on Monday, you yeah, know, wait till you're done your test first. <laughs> She's like, geez, talking about me. Uh, but other than that, yeah, that's the situation here. Okay. Now, on to the last lecture, because there's not much else I can say past this. This is what you need to look at. Okay. Now, when we talk about inventory allocation, Inventory allocation is an odd thing. A lot of people don't think about what's actually happening when you buy something on it from a shopping cart. Now, I'm going to talk about Etsy, where it's built to order. Normally, stuff on Etsy, you know, you buy a, a birthday card, they make it on the fly after you've ordered it. But for st shops like Amazon, Chapters, uh, even the guys that sell custom t-shirts like Shark Robot, and awesome tees, those guys. Well, they have something called inventory allocation. And that means that when you buy something, it's yours, but it's not yours until you it gets shipped out the door. And essentially what happens is, let's just say, and this is the simplest example, um, you're gonna place an order, you add stuff to the shopping cart, and then you hit process the payment. At this point in time, You've bought something, and but it hasn't been shipped yet. So let's say that you bought you bought five T-shirts, and they've got twenty T-shirts in stock. What an inventory allocation says it says out of those twenty T-shirts, five have been ordered. Pretend they're not even here. Once it's shipped out the door, it actually removes it from inventory because now it's gone, and it clears the allocation. And this is the simplest style, and this actually kind of sucks, this method, this one here. 
In other words, you create an entire order, you allocate the inventory once you've processed the payment, and then <coughs> once the order gets shipped, what it does, it depletes the inventory, so you say there's five that are allocated, the inventory down by five, so 20 minus five is 15, and then you delete the allocation. Gone, done, over with. That's the simplest allocation system. Can anybody think just why this is kind of bad? Add an item to the order. Okay, so you've added five t-shirts. And you're in the middle of fighting with your credit card because it's not working because you keep mistyping two numbers because, you know, credit card numbers. Keep screwing up your payment. In the meantime, somebody goes and buys 20 t-shirts. Now what happens is this payment processes first, yours, then you've accepted the payment, but the system now says, oh wait, there's no more inventory. Because somebody else just bought it all. So what happens when you do an allocation like this is the process here, it, de it depends on how fast can you get through the payment processing. Uh, that's when the allocation is done. I've seen this done for companies that ha always have inventory. There are such things out there. Um, for example, furniture makers, they always assume there's inventory on currently on current product. That means that they'll allocate five chairs. They might only have three because they need to make another two, but they're guaranteeing that you're going to get five. Yes? How do you work around if it's like hundreds of those people trying to try them out of like products, but then there's like a thousand million people trying to order at the same time? Queuing. Um, which actually I'm going to show you a somewhat simpler one. Um, but essentially what a queuing does, to answer your question, um, for a large volume, there's two things that happens. One, when you say, I bought a ticket, you know, you add tickets to your card and say, these tickets are available for a number of minutes, and then you lose your app, just like airline tickets, right? God forbid if they overbook your plane. United Airlines. Yes, I read it also. <laughs> but the same thing with Ticketmaster, right? Tickets go on sale. They still have to do things to scalpers, and then you get to buy your tickets. Um, but essentially, there's a queuing system that says, "Oh, you're only allowed. You only have so much time to buy this." And when it's really, really busy, the system is almost self-maintaining because if you can't get at the site, you can't buy the tickets. And we all know how good Ticketmaster's website is. We all know how good their site is because it you know, blows up every time there's a big uh, concert. I think the last time I tried to buy tickets from Ticketmaster during a big concert was last time. This is from my wife when Cher came to town. Ten seconds and the website went down. She couldn't even get in. Ping of death. Okay, so this is a slightly better method. So this would be not the way Amazon does it, but this would be like, say a company like Sharp Robot would do it. Or these are companies that only ship your entire order to you at once. Whereas, you know, you got an Amazon that'll ship you partial as the things become available. They'll group them up and as, you know, so three can be shipped by tomorrow and the other two will take a week. They'll ship the three and then ship the other two. So they do item-based allocations. Um, this would be like the t-shirt suppliers or then the grocery providers. You know, some people actually buy groceries online, they deliver it, and they allocate the inventory for the entire order. And the way these work is you go to add an item to the order, it checks to see if there's enough inventory. Now, the way the math works for this is it says, how many items do you want? Is this less than total inventory minus whatever has been allocated. So let's say there's 20 items, five are allocated, it assumes inventory is 15. A little bit of magic math happens in there. Therefore, if you want to order 16, it's gonna to say too bad, you can't order that because we don't have that many in stock. But if you are able to add it to your shopping cart, what happens is if there's enough inventory, and this is my SL labels, of course, um, if there's enough inventory, it creates the allocation right away. So add to cart, oh, he wants five and there's 15 available, creates the allocation right off the bat, then it adds the item to the shopping cart. Then it asks you if you want to add another item. 
As you can see, the allocation gets created as you add stuff to the shopping cart. It's in a it's in a in a bin, and for the big providers, maybe it gets a lot fancier than this. But I'm simplifying. It keeps allocating inventory as long as you haven't bought. Now, in the case of the concert tickets or uh, airline tickets, what's happening is on this allocation here, they put a deadline. They usually what they'll do is they'll put in a created, like a when was this allocation created? And if it's more than so many minutes, it deletes the allocations automatically. So there's like a, a process that runs all the time, pinging the database say every, every minute, saying any allocations older than say five minutes, if there is, too bad, it's gone for that case. Uh, for most systems, the allocation release happens usually every hour, every two hours. If they notice that you haven't interacted with your shopping cart for more than X number of minutes, they'll release the allocation but leave the stuff in the cart. So when you reactivate, say, the next day, like with Amazon, it'll check the allocations and you know recreate the allocations as needed. Or it'll tell you, I can't buy this anymore. But what happens here is it keeps adding up items, creates the allocation, on and on. Okay, I've got everything I want. No, we're not adding anything else. It processes the payment. So at that point, you've accept, they've accepted payment and what happens now if you're the flaggers that update allocations for the order? What this is saying is, hey, these allocations are valid. They're not going to expire anymore because we accepted the payment. We update the order, say payment accepted. And at that point, it may or may not update the allocations depending how the system works. And then I added a white box there called sometime later. The order is marked to shift. In other words, the order came in at 11 o'clock at night by 9 a.m. two days later, everything's been packaged up, it's in a box, everything's been picked, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. They mark it as shipped, the order's been shipped, they put in a pure later code or whatever. It updates the inventory. So in other words, what it does is it looks at all the allocations in the order and updates all the applicable items in inventory. So it depletes the inventory by minus whatever you bought, and then it nukes the allocations. So the allocations go away like they never even happened. Boom, done. So these are for, these would be a mid-sized company. So people that ship, say, a thousand t-shirts a day. And that, you know, either print the t-shirts themselves or they buy them pre-printed, um, that kind of stuff. Now the next one, <laughs> there's more boxes. Now, this is what Amazon does in chapters and Walmart, super simplified. There should be about three, three times more boxes in here than there is. But you'll notice this side here, I got my DSO flags on this one now. This one here hasn't changed, right? Everything on the left stayed the same. Process payments stay the same. Update allocation stays the same. Some time later happens. This is the per item allocation. So that means that we don't worry about whether or not the whole order has been shipped. We track whether or not a given item has been shipped. So how many of you have bought stuff from Amazon and they sent it to you in two or three shipments? Right? Even when it's coming from Amazon, but some's coming from Mississauga, some's coming from Vancouver, some of it might be coming from Montreal's warehouse. Obviously, if they're not going to send it from Montreal to Mississauga and Mississauga to you, they ship it from each of the different warehouses. And what they do there is that as the items are put in a box, taped shut, they apply a shipping label to it, the item is marked as shipped. What it does at that point is updates the inventory, <coughs> releases the allocation. Then it does a little bit of, have we shipped everything in the order? If not, it goes back to sometime later while the rest of it processes, rinse and repeat all the way through, and if Suddenly it hits the point where all the items in the order have now been shipped. It marks the order as complete and gone. As you notice, the order doesn't get marked complete until it's processed all the items in the order. So the only difference between this one and the one before is one marks the entire inventory as allocated and it releases the allocations when the entire order is shipped. This one really adds and releases inventory based on as each item goes out the door. So, like I said, for Amazon and Walmart, 
Now theirs is much more complicated because over here, one of the allocations, what it does, it also looks at where warehouse it's available in. It sets up the allocation on a per warehouse basis, saying warehouse one has items one, two, three, warehouse two has items four, five. And there's all these if statements and all that jazz. Um, that's not important to this and how they do their warehouse management. I'm just talking about the allocation of the inventory. Uh, but sometimes what happens is there'll be two in one warehouse and three in the other and you ordered five. What happens then? Now, if this is like NCIX, which NCIX is really stupid, the way they do this, they'll take the three, ship it to where there's two, take it out of inventory, put it back into inventory, put it all in a box, and then ship it to you. Even though know, they could have shipped it from both warehouses at the same time to you, and you get your stuff in three days, sometimes it takes up to two weeks to get your stuff because of how they do their warehouse management. Amazon, on the other hand, will send you two from one and three from the other because their volume is so big they can afford the postage. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually write a set of triggers to do the inventory management. Often this is all written in code in Java or C Sharp or PHP or whatever the hell. Uh, but you can actually do it all inside of triggers. And what that does is it takes a lot of the business logic out of the programmer's hands and maintains it inside the database server where it's being cached by the server. There's less uh, possibility of mistakes being made. Uh, if a patch needs to be done, you apply it to the database, fix the trigger. It's fixed. Um, there's pros and cons. Uh, this will also bring into the concept of cursors. And when I start writing in the stuff about the cursors, I'll explain what cursors are and how they work. Okie dokie. Any questions about how the allocation stuff should behave? Time to shut the door. I'll be right back. Oh, you got it? Thanks. Any questions about the concept of how allocations work? I mean, it's not a hard concept when you think about it. I just wish I had a stack of paper, otherwise I would have done it with pieces of paper, which I usually carry around with me, but the only paper I've got has confidential information on it. Um, but yeah, all I'd have to say is, you know, he's got five pieces of paper, I bought two, he gives two to him to hold on to for me. And then once it's done, he hands them to me, but well, in the meantime, it's still in the same place. It's just two no longer belong to him, they belong to me. Once he hands them to me, they're no longer in their building, it's now to me, allocation released. And the math is, how many can we have? How many he's got, minus how many he's holding. And that's the basic concept of inventory allocation. Um, I have put a little database on Blackboard for this. Um, and it's called Inventory Example. You'll see four tables in it. Uh, oh shoot, I closed that. I need this over here. All right, so I'm gonna show you guys what's inside of these tables. Actually, tell you the truth, there's not a whole lot in these tables. At the moment, they're completely empty, except four products. There's four products. As you can see, there's a little bit of inventory. So in this case, inventory is how many are actually available in the building. Come on camera, focus. I love it when the camera stops focusing. There we go. All right, so I've got four products I'm going to play with. Uh, looking at some of the other tables, uh, 
As you can see, I've got very simple fields in here, ordered or shipped on, payment accepted at. These are all different fields we can use for inventory allocation um, and for obviously order ship, order processing. Ordered would be one was the, the order placed, one was it shipped on, or in other words, they put the mailing label on it and been picked up up here later. Payment accepted at, you know, payments done. Um, we also have order lines, which has what did we buy, how much did we buy, and was it ever shipped? And there's also allocations. And in here, you got one was the allocation created. That would take care of, you know, for example, the ticket master bit, where it's counting down how long has that, this allocation been sitting around. Um, order line ID. Okay. When you calculate allocations, you have to keep track of the allocation based on what was bought. Not the order, what order was in is totally relevant. It's what order line that's relevant. In other words, which item in the order was it? The quantity, this is how much we've allocated. And then when was the order completed? Um, I'm going to keep this fairly simple. I'm going to do um, an allocation system that does, as each item is added to the shopping cart, it'll create the allocation. Once the order is fully shipped, it releases the allocation. Instead of doing the per item, I'm going to do the whole order. So. The first step you want is a trigger that checks whether or not you have available inventory. And considering I'm winging this trigger right now, um, we're going to, you know, there's going to be mistakes made. All right. As we all know, we always check our delimiters. And we're going to create a trigger. Trigger. Uh, I think I call it order lines. For each row. In and like such. So before insert. Now theoretically, I'm going to keep this simple. However, we should probably have a before update trigger also. What happens if the person changes how many they wanted to buy? We should check, make sure there's still enough inventory available. But I'm keeping this simple. So I'm just going to do before it gets added to the shopping cart. You're not allowed to go change how many you're buying. We're going to be a bit draconian. So we need to declare a few variables. Uh, I guess I need to make this All right, so as always, there's always a little bit of math and we can get fancy with this. We can use a bunch of different sub queries and whatnot, but I'm going to keep it basic. On hand means how many are in the building. Allocated means how many that are in the building that no longer belong to us, but haven't left the building yet. As I said earlier, he has five pieces of paper. I buy two pieces of paper from him. So I hand, he hands two pieces of paper to him to hold on to until I come and collect them. That means that on hand, there's five, but two no longer belong to me because they've been allocated. That's what that allocated variable is for. Uh, the next one I'm going to want to do is uh, I want to retrieve 
a variable into a query uh, from a query. So essentially what's going to happen is I'm going to set oh shoot I'm going to go Now, and in here, I gotta set the variable, hold on. A few different ways of doing this. And depending on how you wanna to do it, I'm just trying to pull up the two here. And it's a little odd the way it works. And it's just unfortunate the way it works. I'm going to add at signs on this because it'll apparently that's what they want us to do. It's a really weird syntax. And essentially, it's just the way it is. Um, because that's how MySQL and on doing other procedural languages such as Postgres and Oracle's will do uh, select inventory into whatever the variable name is called. It's a little nicer. Um, that's how that one works. Now I'm going to do a second one and this one is what's well, been allocated. Now, some of you might have been noticing I was looking at this table and I shook my head sideways um, because I wrote this in a slightly odd and obtuse manner. Do you notice in here I don't talk about product ID anywhere in here? In the allocation, there's no product ID at all. There's a few ways of handling this. One, the easiest answer is add a product ID to the table. Or, we can actually do a subselect. So that what you do is you grab all the allocations where the order lines match certain product IDs. Um, you know, there's a variety of ways of doing this. And I'd recommend actually adding a column. Um, I was basing this on a, on a different trigger I'd written previously using Postgres and it handles this a lot better. Um, so what you'll want to do is you want to alter your table if you do have this example. So I'm going to run this. Hit go. Now, we have our two variables, right? We now know how many we have in the building and we know how much has been set aside. So, what's the math? <coughs> you can go if Actually, we should make this a less than. All right, so here's the logic. I'm going to go 
point at the screen for a second. All right, so we declared our two variables. We're checking to see how many we have on hand. We're checking how many is allocated. Here's the math. If the on hand minus the allocated, okay, in other words, we have five in the building. He's, there's five total there. But he's holding two pieces of paper that has been allocated. Is less than the new quantity. In other words, I'm trying to add an order line, and I want to buy four. There's five in the building, but two no longer are available. So five minus two is three. Is three less than four? Yes. Therefore, we have a problem. I don't have enough to sell to you. Therefore, then we raise an error. And I just need to go and grab that stupid raise message. Because I know I posted the examples. I've got too many things open on my screen. You guys can't see everything else I've got open over here. I'm insufficient. I'm sure it's misspelled. That's okay. And then that's it. In other words, if, a, if something's wrong, it'll raise an error. If there's nothing wrong, it just keeps on trucking. How many of you want to bet I didn't get this right on the first try? Create it. Pardon me? No, that's right. No, that's normal. It's complaining up here. Really? See, it doesn't like that if I do it that way. And I even have an exact example that I've done before just to make sure this was working. All right, we're going to use the Postgres syntax. And that should work. Let's hope it works this time. Oh, no errors. Okay, I'm actually going to create 
I'm going to open up another tab so I can keep my trigger separate from what's happening. So I'm going to first create an order. Okay, something really quick and easy. Okay, that's been created. So, that's okay. I'm going to add something to order lines. I hope my code works. I should go order ID first. All right, so all I've got here is a bunch of numbers. It's order number one, product number one, and I want to buy three. Show of hands, how many of you think I actually got my code working? Oh, confidence is overwhelming. Go. Oh, that's not so bad. Did I forget something really important? Like an order ID on my order table? That helps, don't you say? Okay, so I added an order line, order table. Oh, look at this, something happened. Let's go see what's in our allocations. Oh, what'd you do? Get one more of these. And nothing happened. Now, the reason why nothing happened is I didn't add anything to the allocations yet. But what I want to test with all code is you should test little bit by little bit. So what I should try to do now is try to add um, So this one here, product one, has an inventory of five. So I'm going to try to add seven and hit go. And it worked anyways. That's because somewhere in here my code's not working, and that's because of these damn ad signs. I bet you. Again, and we're going to try one more time. And it's still letting me do it. I'm going to modify my trigger so I can start adding debugging. And I'm going to actually cause error messages to start happening. So, now we're going to do this. Now, this is part of, all part of the process of creating triggers. And this is not the kind of triggers I'm asking you to do for the exam, by the way. Just so you know, that's not what I'm after. All right. I've got an error code five. On hand is good. Now I'm going to change this to see what happens with allocations. And I'm going to put this on a single line to make sure things are a little more clean. So we're going to check how many has been allocated. And we're going to hit do this. Then we're going to do this. Can't be set to null. Now, I don't know if you remember math, but what happens if you take a number and you subtract a null from it? 
Is that something you can actually do? So what's happening is it's taking a number, subtracting null from it, and it turns it into null. And then MySQL tries to get clever and it says, by the way, is null less than five? Can it be? Can it not be? This is one of the ones I'm glad where MySQL actually behaves the same as, uh, as Postgres. But actually I was expecting it to just keep trucking. And there's a few ways of checking this, and that's what I thought. So we go back to our trigger, right over here. Because what's happening is nothing's ever been allocated, therefore there's nothing to do math on. So what we want to do is we want to go, if allocated is null, then allocated <laughs> and I, of course I keep forgetting the darn set keyword. So what we're doing is we're saying if it's allocated, if, if none are allocated, therefore we're going to set the allocated to zero. At that point we can go seven <laughs> minus zero is seven. So we recompile our trigger one more time. And we do this one more time. And now it shows zero. There's my number showing how many have been allocated. So now I'm going to comment out this line. I'm going to rebuild it so it doesn't die. Let's hope it works. Success. So what's happening now is it checked. I don't have enough inventory to buy what you want to buy. No, you're not allowed to buy seven when I've only got five. Congratulations. Now, on the other hand, if I change this to be two, like such, and I hit run, I was allowed to add it in because two. That's less, less than five. I know this is basic math, grade school math. So now we're doing, if you remember on the flow chart, we did the, do we have enough sufficient inventory? Yes or no? Bang, our first trigger has been created. We're checking inventory. Can yay for us. First trigger is successful. I'm going to take this, I'm going to copy it and shove it in my notepad. Now I'm going to create another trigger. Because really, we now know we have enough inventory, so what should we do next? Allocate the inventory. So we are going to create an after trigger. We're going to call this trigger allocate inventory and I'm going to clean up the, the insides. Just like that. Now why is this after insert instead of before insert? Anybody want to take a 10 second guess? Should you allocate inventory if the offhand chance that insert fails. You checked that there's an inventory available, but for some unknown reason, the insert would fail. Should you still allocate inventory for stuff that's not even been ordered? No. Therefore, it's why it's after insert, because if the insert fails, it'll never fire off the following trigger. And this one's really straightforward. There's no, there's no logic to it nothing. You go insert into allocations. And I gotta make sure I got all my columns right. And in here, what do we want to insert? We want to insert the order line ID, the quantity, and the product ID. And the, from the following values, and I have to go double check something really quick. I 
Oh, good. Same as I expect. I just had to double check it behave the same as other <laughs> databases because MySQL is special that way, right? It doesn't always cooperate the way it should. Okay, so when you do an insert and it's an after trigger, there, if you have an auto increment column such as ID, it will assign the value of new.id to it. But it's only the new.id is only available after the insert. At least that's what the documentation says. We're going to find out in a minute if that's true. Uh, but that's how it works in Postgres, Oracle, and Microsoft SQL Server. Um, in the meantime, we're also allocating the new quantity, and we're also allocating um, the product ID. So that at this point, we're saying, okay, this product has ordered two in this order line. And that's all this trigger should need. So we're going to find out in a second if this compiles. And it did. So I'm going to truncate my order lines and I'm going to hit run. No error messages. Could it be? I better write on the first try. So select star from order lines. So there's one order line, quantity two. And we're also going to go From allocation, that should make this a little bit bigger. And here's our allocation. Holy crap, it worked. I like it when it works on the first try. Obviously, there was no logic in this one. That's why it worked on the first try. It was easy. So now what's happened is we have on-hand inventory, and we now have an allocation. So we said that there was two in inventory, or there was five in inventory, and two have been allocated. So how many do we have left on hand now? Available. Five in the building. <laughs> Two were allocated to someone else. That says, how many do we have left? Oh, I could go, yes, please, thank you, three. Now people just don't want to talk, speak up. It's like crickets. I almost had to call a good and grade one for that one. All right, five minus two is three. The math should say we only have three left available. So now we're going to find out if my inventory check works. I want to buy four which is more than three. Um, I am not going to truncate the order line. I'm going to go hit go. And it worked. God damn it. Now we have six allocated. What does that tell me? My other trigger is broken. So this trigger I'm going to save because it works. Obviously, this one's working really well. I'm allocating the inventory I don't even have. And i got to bring back my other trigger. There are days I miss working with Postgres. Um, Oops, I don't want to save that. Really? I'm just going to have to create another variable. All right. Let's rebuild our trigger. Trigger does not exist. Main doesn't exist. Okay, let's do this again. Available, minus one.
Mm. Let's try this piece of logic. Go. Trigger already exists. Of course it does. Because it didn't exist earlier. Bang. Do this again. Let's try doing this again. Now it's working. Why is it working? I have no idea. Other than MySQL's anal retentive about its brackets. So logically, there's no difference between this and what I had earlier, right? I do the math here that I was doing it in the if statement. Apparently, it doesn't like if you do it in the if statement. Why? I don't know, because you can do that in every other database server. Yay. So now I'm trying to grab more than I have. Good for us. So if I go and do the following queries, you should see select star from products and allocations. <coughs> so there's our products. We have five in inventory. And right now we have lots of allocations. I should truncate all that. Truncate order lines. Truncate allocations. By the way, we never do this on a production server. I was allowed to do that because there's actually that many left. If I run this, you can see that there's five available. Four have been allocated. So I'm going to try to buy another four. It's going to say, I can't buy it. It's all good. So now the only trigger that's left to do, one left, is the order has been shipped. This is where the cursors come in. And you're, I'll probably be cursing while I'm using the cursors uh, because they're weird in my skill. Anybody else you can do. Uh, did you guys learn uh, um, in Python for each? Yeah. Okay. My skill doesn't have for each. You have to write a loop and then quit the loop when you hit an error. It's kind of dumb. But that's just how it's done. So. We're going to go with it. So I'm going to take this trigger and I'm going to save it so I can give it to you guys. Paste. All right, so I've got two triggers so far. Now I just need the last one. And this one here, we're going to call it um, shipped. I'm, I'm preemptively putting in my drop triggers. I know I'm going to get this wrong. All right, now to declare my cursor. What we need to do is we need to declare a few different things. And I just need to be able to see all of it on one screen. So we're going to declare the following variables. And we're going to call them one. Wow, what the heck was that? We're going to get a variable called exit loop, where it's going to be a boolean. Why? Because we need some way to know that we're supposed to be done now. We are going to declare a cursor, and we're going to declare a handler. where this is on orders. So there's a few other things we're going to change, but that's where that's where we define the cursor. All right, so some of us might bring gets ahead of me. So here's what we're doing. I'm going to create a trigger. It's going to be called order shift. It's after update on orders. So what's going to happen is I'm declaring a cursor. And it's all, all this stuff's only happening after 
an order gets updated. We're going to add an if statement in there in a bit to double check, make sure that we need to do this. Can you imagine if we release the allocations every single time somebody updated the order? You know, we change your shipping address, something, and then whoop, let's clear up the allocations. So we need to check whether or not the order has actually been shipped. So I've declared a cursor. So what a cursor is, is it's a pointer to a query. In Python, you guys, did you guys learn how to loop through records in Python? Yeah? So you'd run a query and you'd assign the result set to a variable and then you'd loop through the results of that variable? Same idea. <laughs> Except in this case, you're in the database directly. What a cursor is, is it's the results of a query. And you're going to loop through the results of the query. And the results of a query inside of a database function or a trigger or a procedure is known as a cursor. That's it. That's what a cursor is. It's the problem with cursors is how you handle them. So, so far, I've created a cursor that's going to retrieve all the order lines for the order I'm currently updating. Fair enough. And here's some of the joy of voodoo. Now, how stupid is this statement? <laughs> this looks like a chunk of COBOL. If anybody here has ever seen COBOL, this is exactly what COBOL looks like. Here's what's happening. is I'm declaring a handler <laughs> for when you get a not found error, record not found. You declare a continue. In other words, hey, we have an error. That's OK. Let's keep on trucking. But while we do this as part of the exception handler is we're going to set a variable equal to true. Um, do you guys learn about try catch? Fail? So what this is, this whole system, the way it works is it's like a big giant try loop until it blows up. And then in the catch, you're going to set exit loop to true and you're going to say, okay, now go back to where you were and we're going to try this one more time. Nice QL. But that's okay, because that's just how it works. So at this point, I've created my bits and boodles that I need. I've got my Boolean to, to, to decide when I'm done. I've got a cursor to loop through my order lines. And I've got a handler. All right. Now, and let's hope this works the way I expect it to. Now we're going to open our allocation cursor. What the open does is says, run this query. Up till now, we've defined a query, but we haven't done anything with it. Open means, OK, run the query, but don't do anything yet. And then we're going to create ourselves a loop. All right, so do you see this, this cute little bit in front of the word loop? This is known as a label. We're assigning a label. But it just looks like a variable, too. That's why this is challenging. So we have a loop label saying, OK, this is, you know, we're defining the beginning of the loop, and this is where it is. Anybody here ever see basic or fortune? Well, in the basic and fortune, you could do something called go to. It allows you to jump somewhere else in the code. But with some of the more modern languages, like C++ now has GoTo. They actually gave GoTo to C++ programmers, which have to define a label, say, go to this label in the code. That's what we're doing. We're giving a spot, like a bookmark in the code, saying, this is the chunk. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to end my loop right off the bat because, you know, that's just good habit. Like this. So we have our loop. We have our end loop. And now in here, we got to make magic happen.
And this is another spot where things get funny with cursors in MySQL. If you do cursors in Postgres, what happens is it creates, you have to create something called, or this applies to Oracle and, and my, uh, Microsoft SQL Server. You create a variable type called a record. MySQL being MySQL is you can't create a record type variable, at least not what I can see in the documentation. What you have to do is you have to declare more variables. Yay for us. Now, because in order lines, we don't need a lot. All we need from order lines really is the product ID. So that means we need to declare another variable up here. And while we're at it, we might as well go and grab the order line ID also. Why? Why not? So we're going to pull back the order line ID and the product ID. Close that off. Oh, now I can't read it. So let me just put this on another line here so it's a little less scrolly for everybody. So we've got ourselves a cursor. We've got ourselves a handler. We've got two variables we've defined up here. And what we can do now is we're going to go uh, into order line ID, comma, product underscore ID. So what's happened is we're going to retrieve the cursor and we're going to assign the two columns pulled back from cursor to the two variables we've defined. And we're going to loop. And So right now, exit loop has been created to Boolean, but it defaults to false because it hasn't been set. If exit loop's been set to true, we need to quit because, you know. But how do we know it's it's done? The fetch up here gets an error, which gets handled up here, and it sets it to true. So it says if we're doing a try here, the catch is up here, and it continues down here. Always close your cursors. <laughs> okay. So you close the cursor and you leave the loop. It's such broken logic, but that's how it is. All right. I'm going to build this. I know error message. That's like a miracle. And I'm going to go update order set. I think it's French, uh, orders set. I'm going to fire this off, and it should theoretically run the trigger. I hope. Orders shipped on. Was it? No, apparently I don't remember my columns. Order shipped on. Go oh, Dan. Gonna do it one more time. Nice well workbench. Okay. Good news. The trigger didn't explode. It doesn't actually do anything yet, but the trigger didn't explode. So that means our cursor technically works. So now we go and look back at our cursor. Now, what we want to do down here is in right here, we want to do the rest of our logic now. What do we have to do? We have to decrement the inventory. And we have to decrement, and we have to delete the allocation. So, as we've already experienced, our variables 
the math is anal retentive in this. So what we need to do is the following. We need to add another variable at the top. Why? We need to know how many have been allocated. That means we need to go retrieve the quantity allocated out of the allocation. And we also will probably need to, to pull out how many we actually have on hand. So if we go declare available int. That looks familiar. It's almost the same as the other trigger that checks our quantities, right? So now we need to run two more statements. Actually, it's quantity into allocated from allocations where order line underscore id is equal to so we have a variable up here called order line id and we need to retrieve it and we're going to match the allocations order line id and i this is going to cause me problems i'm sure All right, so I'm going to update my thing. Trigger already exists. Of course it does. Update my trigger. Because I'm, I'm going to build this up a little bit by little bit and make sure nothing blows up in my face as I'm developing it. I'm going to go run this. No error messages. Good for me. Now, the fact that I'm using now means that the record will be updated no matter how many times I run this, the record will update. That's what I'm using now to check. All right, so, so far we have the quantity that's been allocated. We need another variable. Uh, inventory into available from uh, products where I did collect the product ID, didn't I? Yes. Where uh, products.id is equal to product. So this product ID here is what I was allocated, what I created earlier, the variable, and this is the field. So we're pre-building all our amounts here, and it should theoretically work. So now, we're going to need one more piece of math, which is just so much fun. Claire, uh, new, I'm going to call it new available. <coughs> like this. So now we need to do one more piece of math. Set um, new underscore available equal to um, Inventory. I don't um, into um, available minus allocated. That is not how you spell available, is it? Like such. I don't want you to create the. Tr oh, my shift key stuck. Hold on. There we go. Okay, trigger has been created. So I'm setting my new available. Again, I'm going to test, make sure nothing's breaking because we're going to want to do it one little bit at a time. So we set our new available. So now we know how much we have available because it's been the allocation has been dealt with ish. We should now update products. Set. Um, inventory equal to new available where product ID is and then where I'm actually going to take care of the rest of the trigger in one go here. Delete from allocations where order line score ID. 
I just gotta make sure I preface that. Oops. So here are the two steps. I now know how much I have left in the building because we. this is what this is gonna do. Here, we're gonna update the product, make sure that the now available inventory is real because the box has now been picked up by a year later. And at the same time, after we've decremented the available inventory, we have to release the allocation. And let's hope this works. Damn. Did that work? Okay, trigger created. Now, how many of you want to bet that this isn't going to work? Because that's just how my life has been lately. Well, that's not bad. Uh, column not found because I have a typo. Products.id. Rebuild your trigger. Come back over here. Run this. Safe update mode. This should just work. Yeah, this here, but that shouldn't be affecting it. I'm just going to comment out the code and see which one's causing it to bark. And I'm going to do this. One changed. All right. So now let's go look at our products, and hopefully my math worked. Quantity four. Uh, that's the order lines. So hold on. The products is here. Five. My math isn't working. Why? Forget my note. Um, because that should work. And I'm going to make a few quick changes and see if it's going to behave like I expected to. At, at, at. What I'm going to do is I'm going to rename my variables a little bit because it's something is throwing it for a loop and I don't know what it is because this should work and it's not. And I tried this while I was sitting in the lab earlier and it worked. Go figure. And I've got one chunk of syntax that's different and I don't know what it is and it doesn't like this I'm guessing. So I'm going to prefix this with a V. That, this, and this. And we're going to go this, 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 and this. <coughs> Unknown system variable, new. This, go. Trigger does not exist. Of course not. Done. Let's try that one more time now. Go. Cool. All right, this is better. That. I see a. Typo. Where? Uh, unless that's what you want with the order line ID? Uh, yeah, because I'm created a variable up here called order line ID. 
and I shove the V in front of it so I can oh. visually identify the difference. Um, like such. And do that one more time. That's always the problem also, you never <coughs> really know. Two allocations. Is this the one that's working? Rebuild. Try it one more time. Okay, it's not that one. I think it might be your declare allocation cursor. Oh, it could well be. All right, we're going to walk our way up, back up to it. Okay, not that one. Good work. So, all right. I will finish fixing this one out on my own time. The concept is here. For some unknown reason, my cursor is not working the way as advertised. And I'm talking, it's not even showing as advertised on Stack Overflow, which is usually a pretty safe bet. That's how it works. Uh, but this is how it's supposed to work. And in the end, I just should have done this in Postgres to show you guys. It would have been 10 times faster uh, with 100% less errors. Um, essentially, I'll go through the code one last time for what it's supposed to be doing. And then if we manage to figure it out, I'll sort it out. We're going to declare a bunch of variables at the top. We need to know what the product ID and the order line ID are. We need to set a boolean to drop out of the loop. We need to know how many were allocated, how many are currently available, and we have to have a new available value. We declare a cursor. We declare our handler. We open our cursor at this point. Everything's set up. We open the query. <coughs> then what we're going to do is we're going to loop through. And for every row, we're going to assign the values into those two columns. If I hit an error, it's going to set the exit loop to true. So exit loop, then it closes the cursor, leaves the loop. Otherwise, if it hasn't quit, it retrieves theoretically the quantity and the available amounts. Um, it sets the new available inventory. In other words, it calculates how much it's supposed to be. It updates the products to have the new value. And then it deletes from the allocations the new the, the allocation itself. Then it does it for the next product, the next order line, the next order line, next order line, until there's no more allocations and all the inventory has been decremented. That's the theory that's supposed to happen in my code. Apparently it's not working for Dan today. And you know, it's one of those things where um, if, and if ever you've done presentations and suddenly things just don't work, you know exactly how I feel right now. <laughs> Um, mildly embarrassing, but such as life, we've had a good debugging, group debugging session. Obviously, Sarah picked out a stupid on my code right off the top. So that was great. Uh, and I'm sure whatever's wrong is probably this tiny little thing in there. And like I said, once I figure out, I'll post the working trigger. I'll take some time tomorrow and see if I can figure it out. I'll post the a working trigger for you guys so you guys actually have a you know a working example. But that's the logic behind a cursor and how you'd use a cursor. Um, to follow up, there are um, pr a price to pay when you use cursors. If you're affecting a large chunk of data, your transaction takes longer. Like for example, let's say it's an order with a thousand items. That means it needs to loop one thousand times run each of the embedded queries 1,000 times. So that means that you've got one query running that retrieves 1,000 rows. And in this case, we've got what? Two selects, an update, and a delete. That means those four queries are run 1,000 times. So in the end, you have 1,000 rows being affected. You're going to run 1,001 queries. I mean, 4,001 queries. Four queries times 1,000 plus the initial one. 4,000 queries is expensive. There are better ways of doing it, but that's the way I'm trying to do it with a, curve, with a trigger. Um, alternatively, for this particular item, if you were going to write it so it's written in Python or C Sharp or Java or whatever, 
I could write it as two single update statements, a single update and, update and delete statement, where you do an update that joins another table, and then you do a delete where, um, and then you select a list. Uh, that'd be the, the way if you did it programmatically in your code. Uh, this is much more tightly embedded. It's not relying on an application to suddenly die or not die. But apparently I can't get it to work tonight. So, you know, I've reached that stage where I'm not adding anything of value to anyone. And yeah, the demo has failed. Um, but that's it. So that's the end of that for tonight. Last good lecture. Um, As promised, here's the update. Um, apparently, I had some misnamed variables yesterday at the end of the demo, and that's why it was a mess. After looking at uh, another at a students, what they were typing, I guess I should say their code, I realized my mistake. And it literally was, at that point, getting rattled over the fact that it wasn't working and messing it all up correct version has been posted on canvas hope you guys enjoy see you next week